What's up friends, today I'd love to share with you a simple opening trap that you can use in order to win in just about three moves. I know it sounds crazy, but give me a moment I'll share with you it's not clickbait. Moreover, even tile players fell for this trap countless times. I'll show you the game where the number six chess player in the world fell for this trap and therefore it's going to work against your opponents for sure. You start off with the move pawn to d4 and if you normally play the other move, the king's pawn move pawn to e4, don't worry, it's a very simple opening trap, you don't need to know any opening theory because you'll be using the same moves all the time. So d4, in most cases your opponent's response d5, and then you continue with bishop to f4. Basically we're playing the London system on steroids because it's just a lot more effective. Now in this position the most played move by black is knight to c6. Sometimes they develop the other knight first, but it doesn't really matter. Let's say they go knight c6, and you play knight c3 as well. And that's the difference compared to the London system, because on the London system we usually play pawn to c3, but here we would love to have our knight here and we'll see in a moment why it is so critical for us to have it there because after they play knight f6 so far it looks like the most standard development other both sides develop their minor pieces but it's hard to believe that at this point black is already in trouble because after knight to b5 these minor pieces team up against this pawn on c7 and there is no way for black to avoid material losses on the next move you are going to capture this pawn with your knight which will fork the king as well as the rook. Thus, not only you force his king to move, which is already bad as the king will be exposed, but you also grab a pawn and a rook along the way, which is a complete devastation. Now, let's talk about this position, what can your opponent try to do? Now, by the way, in a moment, I'll also share with you how you can win if your opponent does not fall for the trap, bringing your win rate through the roof. But for now, let's talk about this position, which is actually the most common position of this variation. Crazy. Now, some of your opponents will wish to move their rook from danger and they'll move the rook to b8, thinking that as you grab the pawn now, your knight will no longer attack the rook in the corner of the board. But in this case, you simply take the c7 pawn with your bishop instead, still delivering a fork to the rook and the queen this time, and you still win. So, the queen has to move, the only score available is queen to d7, but then you grab the rook anyway, and after knight takes b8, on developing a knight, your knight is in danger, it's attacked by the queen, but you don't even have to move, move back, you can snatch one more pawn on a7, and then possibly this bishop on c8, and some hurricane took place here as you completely demolished his queen side, raising basically half of his army, and you achieve a winning game. Lots of your opponents will play pawn to e5, which loses a pawn, but at least they hope to avoid losing even more material. Now, you happily snatch this pawn on e5 and attack this knight. Your opponent is defended, therefore black can't capture it, they have to move their knight away. Now, what if they move it to e4? In this case, you can finish the game in style with yet another brilliant sacrifice, which is queen takes d5. Like, crazily enough, you just sack the queen in one move, and if your opponent has a hope that you just blunder it, on the next move you play knight takes c7, delivering this fork to the king and the queen, therefore you're going to regain your queen on the next move, and you gobbled up a couple pawns, this king is weak, in the future you can castle queenside, you can maybe play f3 to kick this knight away, and still attack this king along the d-file, once again it's just a complete devastation of black. And there is a final variation that you need to know here, Still, black needs to cope with this threat to their c7 pawn, and if they play pawn to e5 and you now capture it and attack this knight on f6, we discuss that if it goes to e4, you have this phenomenal queen sack on d5. What if your opponent goes somewhere else, like knight to d7? In this case, you can even push through with your main threat. I mean, you could just grab this pawn on d5, and that would also give you a winning game. But you could just go pawn to e6 to open up this diagonal and renew your threat of knight takes c7, and you still win. Therefore, knight going back does not really work for black. Finally, what if he tries to counter strike with knight to h5, saying, hey, I'm gonna win a tempo attacking this bishop. Now, while there are a couple ways to deal with it, there is one way which I love in particular, and it works tremendously well, especially in bleeds. It is the move bishop to g5. Instead of defending the bishop, you are actually baiting your opponent to take it, and in most cases they will, because if not, you know, you have a bunch of threats, you attack the queen, you're still putting pressure to these pawns. I mean, currently they are defended, but if he moves away somehow, you can grab one of them. Therefore, in most cases, your opponent will just grab your bishop on g5. But now this pawn on c7 is no longer defended and you still push through with your main threat of knight takes c7, still delivering this fork to the king and the rook on a8. Moreover, after the king moves, let's say to d8, which is already pretty bad for black, the king is deadly exposed here, you might took this rook here on a8, but there is another move which is even stronger. You may toss in an in-between move knight to f3. 
and this attacks this queen on e5 as well as defends your own pawn on e5. Therefore, you don't let your opponent to even grab your this pawn on e5. Usually, your opponents will bring the queen back to e7, trying to somehow consolidate their position. And here, once again, you could take this rook, that's good enough, but even stronger is to take this pawn on d5 first. So you keep shocking your opponent with every move that you play, you play something that your opponent did not expect. Now, with knight takes d5, you hit the queen once again, plus you clear the d-file of the pawns, thus setting it up for various kinds of discover checks on the next move. For example, if the queen moves somewhere, you could play knight to b6, which will be a check to his king from your queen, but from there, the knight will still get to this rook on a8. Finally, <laughs> somehow Black is in a bad luck with this rook, he's always losing it somehow. Therefore, they'll go queen to d7, desperately trying to cover the d-file. But then you shock them once again, this time with the right hook, pawn to g4. Now, this attacks the knight on f6, and it doesn't have any good squares to go to, as we cover all the squares already. So the knight has nowhere to go. If it doesn't go anywhere, you just crap capture it. And if the queen captures it, then finally your knight decides to change its mind and instead of going for the rook, which was an option, to go for a bigger fish, to go for the queen. Now knight to f6 is a discover check to the king as well as an attack of the queen and you are going to gobble up the queen on the next move. This is a really fantastical and very beautiful devastation. Now, let me show you the game that I promised earlier, where the number 6 chess player in the world fell for this trap. This is a game between Kovalev playing white against Nikolic, who was number 6 at some point. Now, d4, knight of 6. Again, you don't care if they play d5 or knight of 6 first. The move order can vary slightly, but you'll aim for the same trap. You still play knight to c3. You may either start with knight to c3 or bishop f4 in those variations. Usually, it doesn't matter that much. Knight c3 also prepares to grab the center with the move pawn to e4, kind of pushing black to play d5 and get into the position that you want. Now, you still play bishop f4. It is actually kind of a fried liver attack on the queen side, but most players are completely unaware of it, so you still use this double attack of the bishop and knight against this pawn on c7. Now, in this game, black played slightly differently. Instead of going knight to c6, he played pawn to c5. And now, even though white could play knight b5, but in this case, it is slightly less effective, as if you go knight to b5, black can counter that with either queen a5, check to your king, or with knight to a6. So that's the difference. With the you know knight still standing on b8, he can go knight a6 and cover the square. It's not the end of the world for white, but nevertheless, you don't win instantly. Therefore, if they play c5 first, I recommend that you just play e3 defending your center, so that you have nothing to worry about. And then, black played still knight to c6, and as we see this move, you can now happily transition to the main trap, knight to b5, and it is fundamentally game over with knight to c7, forking the king and the rook. Black, again, has no normal defense, he has to sacrifice some material, and he'll find himself usually in a losing position within a couple moves. Now let me show you how to win when your opponent does not fall for the trap. So after bishop f4, the main move, the most common move of black is knight to c6 here. We play knight to c3. And now as we know, our main threat is knight to b5, going for knight takes c7. And that's what we do if they play the usual move knight to f6. The second most common move by black is bishop to f5. Black does not know what to do and they just copy your moves. So <laughs> what do you do in this case? At first, it seems like black is completely solid, really well defended. Knight b5 is no longer dangerous for black. If you play that, they can defend this pawn with a rook and they're fine, therefore knight to b5 doesn't work, work anymore. But there is another line which I'm sure not many players know about and it's really really strong. It's the move pawn to e4. Now very strange looking sacrifice at first, looks like you just miscalculated something as your opponent defends this square twice and he can just grab your pawn, which he will. But then here's the point, you can push your pawn forward to d5 and you launch your attack out of nowhere. Now, this pawn attacks the knight has to go somewhere. In addition to that, this pawn is just giving you some space advantage and makes it difficult for black to develop normally. Let's say the knight goes forward to b4 or to any other square that doesn't really change anything. If it goes here, you can push it back anyway. a3, the knight has to move. This pawn on d5 is defended. His knight cannot capture it. Therefore, the knight will have to go. And at this point, the move that I like, it's also suggested by a computer, I think, it's queen to d4. It's a very multi-purpose move that consolidates your position and prepares for a lot of different cool stuff. Like, first it attacks this pawn twice, therefore you're ready to get your pawn back if you want to. Secondly, you're preparing for castling queenside, which also, like, really solidifies everything and keeps your position very strong. 
Finally, from d4, this queen attacks a lot and is ready to shift here, maybe some variations to attack. And what's bad for black is that they're kind of op oppressed. Uh, sounds like a history lesson. Um, like, th there is not much black can do. This knight isn't going anywhere, right? It's on the edge of the board. And how can black develop this bishop, for instance? If black ever plays pawn to e6, which looks like a very logical move for black to play, trying to open up for this bishop, because they need to develop anyway, you play bishop b5, and strangely enough, that is game over. <laughs> so black has to either move the king to e7, and from there it's going to be completely cramped, and uh, you know the king is overexposed, it'll probably be very easy for you to finalize your attack successfully. If they try pawn to c6, then you don't shy away from sacrificing your queen. We take pawn takes c6, saying, hey, all right, you want my queen? Go take it. And as they do so, you then play pawn takes b7, and your pawn got a great career. From this little pawn on d2, it marched forward all the way through the board, and ultimately, as it's checked to the king, the pawn from d2 really made it big in life. Now it's a new queen, and along the way, we again demolished Black's position, taking away everything we could along the way, and now you're threatening, you know, all kinds of things. So it, it, it'll be game over very soon. That's all the main theory behind this highly effective opening trap, as well as what to do when your opponent does not fall for it. Also, there could be, of course, some other sidelines that your opponents may choose to play, such as something like pawn to e6. I've got another video that I recorded a little bit earlier, where I covered those ways and how can you can develop your attack there. So if you plan to use this opening trap, you may wish to check out this video just as well. Also, I do agree in advance with everyone who says in comments that no one opening traps is not enough to become a strong chess player, and that is why I have this free masterclass for you, which is about chess strategy, and it's much more in-depth thing, and if you want to bring your chess to the next level, you may wish to consider checking this one as well. And then, go crush everyone, take care.